Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. It's a blessing to be here with you guys this Sabbath. I'm so thankful that God has given me the opportunity to come back at this church. I remember my first time coming to the church. It was 2013. I was only 22 years old. I remember speaking for the divine service. I was shaking. I was so scared. I just graduated my degree in theology. I was asked by Pastor Jun Bautista to replace him, and I was so scared. And it's, it's very nostalgic, you know, and, and, and that, you know, when you're a pastor, you're always speaking, and, you know, the pulpit seems to be like a playground. And so I, I can still recall that time where I was so nervous, and it feels so good to be able to recall that time where it's, it's very fresh in my mind. So I'm really grateful that God has given me the opportunity to come back and share the message with you guys this Sabbath. Are you guys happy is the Sabbath? Are you sure? <laughs> Let me tell you a little secret. Well, I always begin with this introduction anyways, but when I was a little younger, I used to hate the Sabbath. I hated the Sabbath so much because I live in a culture of Adventism where the Sabbath and the focus of the Sabbath is the things that you should not do. Have you been in that culture before? You live in a culture where don't do this, don't do that. So the Sabbath, instead of a delight, it becomes a prison. You know, and, the, and growing up, I remember my favorite part of the Sabbath is the sunset. Because <laughs> I hated the church so much. It's filled with restrictions. But I've realized the Sabbath is not supposed to be a burden. It's a delight. Amen? I grew up carrying the Sabbath. Have you been in that situation before where the Sabbath seems to be a burden? And you're, you see these Seventh-day Adventists, they're actually called Sadventists. They're very sad. They're carrying the Sabbath like this. It's a burden, right? Oh, do I go to the church early? All these things. The Sabbath is something that we carry. But if you read the Bible, this, you don't carry the Sabbath. It's supposed to carry you. From all your burdens and from all your fears and from all your heartaches, it's supposed to carry you. The Bible says, come, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The Sabbath is not a burden. It's a delight. And you can only have that experience when you truly have a real connection with God. Um, so I'm grateful that we are here celebrating the Sabbath. And I hope that Sabbath will cease to be a theoretical understanding of a day, you know, but it will become an experience for each and every one of us, an experience of rest. Let me begin with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, for giving us the opportunity to study. Thank you, Father, for the freedom of worship that we can just go to church and not being bothered, that we can sit down in spirit and in truth and also in prosperity and without any problems, Lord, outside. So we thank you for this opportunity, Lord. I pray that you please bless me as I speak, that you please take away self in me, that Christ may appear this very moment. I just pray that you give us an experience with Jesus this Sabbath. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Are you grateful that you are not persecuted today to go to church? Isn't that amazing? Every time I go to a big church, I'm always reminded of my, my time when I went to North Korea. I'm not recommending you guys going to North Korea, by the way. I've never been to South Korea, but I've been to North Korea. And one of the things that they told me before I came into North Korea was never bring any religious literature. You cannot talk to the locals about religion. And if they caught you with the Bible or any religious literature, it's severe punishment. But we are here. It's amazing that we can just sit down in freedom of worship. It's, it's such an amazing gift. The title of our message this morning is Church Redefined. Church Redefined. This Sabbath, I'm going to challenge our culture, and I'm going to call this a culture because it's become a culture, Adventism, and the way we define church as a whole. And I hope and pray that this message will not just be a mere encouragement, but I hope it will be a challenge for each and every one of us this Sabbath. Let me ask you a question today. If someone gets to ask you what your dream church would look like, what, how would you define it? How would you define your dream church? Personally, number one, good potluck. 
Your potluck is bad. I won't go to your church. <laughs> Good potluck. Some people say air conditioned. Some people say that a church that is filled with holy people. <laughs> Someone said that, which is funny. Um, what else? How would you define your dream church? Someone comes to you and says, how do you define your dream church? I worked for, as a pastor for about four years, and this message this morning is just a mere expression of what my dream church would look like. And this is not really a message. This is an expression of, hey, this is what I, my church would look like if I become a pastor again. If I get to choose my dream church, this is how it would look like. And so this is just an expression of that. My dream church. But let me begin with a quote from this guy. I don't know if you guys love horror movies. And usually I don't begin with a secular author. I usually start with the Bible. But this, he springs board the message that we will deliver this, this morning. This guy, his name is Stephen King. Stephen King, eh, for 25 or 30 years, is famous for scaring people. He's the author of one of the scariest movies and books out there. He sold millions of books, and he capitalized that by scaring a lot of us. An expert in scaring people. One time, a person asked Stephen King, Stephen King, what is the scariest word in the English language? What's the scariest word in the English tongue? And he said this, the word alone. He said the scariest word in the English language is the word alone alone. Yes, that's the key word. The most awful word in the English tongue. Murder doesn't hold a candle to it, and hell is only a poor synonym. This guy is an expert in scaring people, and now he said the word alone is the scariest word in the English tongue, especially if you're single. <coughs> scary. <laughs> and 30. <laughs> scary. Or even 40 in single. Scary. The word alone is the scariest word in the English tongue. That word alone. And I agree with Stephen King. I think this is a problem. And in fact, there's a study from Barna Group about 16,000 young adults, it's ages from 18 to 35. There was a study given and they said, loneliness is a crisis, especially during COVID. And they said three out of four out of the 16,000 that was interviewed say they feel lonely at least daily. And 38% of that group say that their loneliness is unbearable. Now, you, you might not agree with this, but some people really, really feel lonely. We're living in a generation where we are hyper-connected, yet we're simultaneously lonely. We're the most connected generation. Would you agree with that? You don't have to wait for a telegram to arrive. I remember my mom would say, they, there's pen pals before. Did you, uh, have you tried be, having pen pals before? You have to wait. Now you have one press of a button and you're connected with someone. One press and you can do video call. We're the most connected generation, yet we're the loneliest. We're the loneliest generation. Mental health problems is on the rise. People are struggling with loneliness. It is never God's design for us to be lonely. This is the island of Patmos in Greece. I visited this island a few months ago, about April, and this, this island until now is very remote. If you fly from Rome, you have to go to Greece, then you have to go to an island called Kos, and you get a ferry for five hours to go to Patmos. Even now in the 21st century, Patmos is still so remote. John the Revelator wrote the, wrote the book of Revelation in this island. It was very remote. And growing up, there was a verse that was so perplexed. He said in the book of John, uh, Revelation chapter 21, he said that in the new heavens and the new earth, he was having a vision, right, of heaven. And he said that in heaven, there'll be no more sea. Now, I studied the beast, I studied the visions, the woman, all these visions in the book of Revelation, but one thing that perplexed me the most is that, man, there's no sea in heaven. That sucks. I love the ocean, and in heaven, there'll be no more sea. And I'm like, ah, oh, this is bad. And then I encountered Ellen White writings about this, and, and Ellen White said that sea separates friends. 
Sea separates families, and John is in Patmos, exiled, away from his family and friends. And now he's in this island alone, separated by the ocean, by the Aegean Sea. And he's writing the letter with a lonely heart longing, look, I want to see my family and my friends, and, more, and worse, I want to see my best friend Jesus. But there's this big sea that separates me. And then God has given him a vision. God told him, look, just wait. In heaven, there'll be no more sea. No more separation. Because we are never made to be alone. It is never God's purpose, even for introverts. Some of you introverts will be like, no, I want to be alone. No, 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 no. Everyone <laughs> needs company, even for introverts. Alone. But did you know that God has a solution for this? God has a, an answer to this problem called the loan. And let's start reading this in the book of John chapter 1. If you have your Bibles with you, if not, just look at the verse up here on the screen. John chapter 1, beginning at verses 1 to 4. It's one of my favorite passages in the book of John. The Bible says, in the beginning was the Word. A little quiz for the Seventh-day Adventists. Who is this Word? Very good. That's Jesus Christ. So notice that as you see the word word, that is Jesus. The Bible says, in the beginning was the word and the word, who's the word again? Jesus was with God and the word was also God. So the Bible tells us that in the beginning was Jesus and Jesus was with God and Jesus was also God. So this is just describing who Jesus is. But notice this. The Bible says, He was in the beginning with God. Now notice that. Put, click save on your mental computer this morning. Notice that. It says, Jesus in the beginning was with God. Geographically, locationally, His address is where? If you send a P.O. box to Jesus or a telegram to Jesus, where would it be addressed? With God, Jesus Christ, address with God, right? That's, that's his address. Geographically, Jesus is with God. He lives with God. Now mark that because in verse 14, jump into verse 14 now, there is a change. Verse 14, John chapter 1, verse 14, the Bible says, and the word, who's the word again? Jesus became flesh and dwelt among us. Did you see a change? You see, what was the change? There's a change in location. And also there's a change in, now he's no longer God, he's also human. Did you get that? So notice this, there is a geographical change. He was first with God, and now he is where? With, I love the NLT. Check out what the NLT said. NLT, New Living Translation, says this. So the Word became human and made His home among us. Isn't that powerful? That's amazing. I read this last night and I was like, man, Jesus became human, the Bible said, and made His home among us. This resonates to what Ellen White said, that Jesus is the very definition of heaven. Heaven is heaven because Jesus is there. And when Jesus left heaven to earth, heaven is no longer heaven. You see, friends, heaven is not heaven because of the streets of gold. It's not because there's no more tears and no more crying. Heaven is heaven not because of the prices that we'll get. <laughs> heaven is heaven because Jesus is there. There's a song by this Brazilian dude called There, and it says, I don't care about the crown or the color of my gown. As long as Jesus is in town, I want to be there. We are not going there for the streets of gold. We're going there because Jesus is there. And But heaven is no longer now with God. He is where? He is among us. There is a geographical change. There is a change of location. This is where we get the word incarnation, carne in Latin, carne, in the flesh, incarnation. Christ became like us in the flesh. In other words, God relocated to where you are. Let me illustrate this to you. You see, for the past 
for thousands of years, religion is all about what can I do to come up nearer to God? That's what religion is all about. Religion is like this. Sorry, camera person, but I'll illustrate this to you. Religion is like this. What can I do so I can go near to you, God? Ah, I'm going to pray 25 Hail Marys, 50 Our Fathers. I'm going to kneel down, offer candles, do all these things, and then, aha, I'm nearer to you. Right? That's what religion is all about. Paganism is based on what can I do in order to peace you? Oh, it's not raining. Let's offer our children. Right? Oh, it's not raining. We should make a dance around the fire. Oh, we should do this. Religion is all, you see that through everywhere. Hinduism, Islam, Buddhism, it's all about what can I do that I may please the deity. Do you get that? And Adventism is kind of like that sometimes. Oh, I'll be a vegetarian. I'll, I won't go to Starbucks. I'll go, to, I'll go early on Sabbath school. I'll do this. I'll do that. Ah, I breached it. No, but that's not what the gospel is all about. The gospel is, look, I'm meeting you where you are. No one said amen. I'm the only one excited. Can you imagine that? <laughs> I don't need to do this, do that, do this. No, 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 no. God said, look, I'm coming down, meet you where you are. Okay, <laughs> I'm so disappointed. But anyways, <laughs> this is what the gospel is all about. What I'm telling you is the gospel. You don't have to do certain things to appease a God. God said, look, look, I'm coming down to meet you. Not where you should be, but where you are. I'll meet you where you are. That's what the gospel is. And so someone said, Ellen White said in the book, Ministry of Healing, she said, grace is an attribute given to undeserving human beings. We do not seek for grace, but grace was sent in search for us. Did you see the language she used? She said, grace was sent in search for me. You do not seek for grace, but grace was sent in search for me. God sent himself to search for you. And so someone said, history is filled with man who wants to be God's. History is filled with man who wants to be God's, but there's only one God who wants to be a man. I preached this one time near Ukraine, and I said, there are people who want to be gods. And someone shouted, Putin! Putin wants to be God. <laughs> but it's true. It, throughout history, man wanted to have the power of gods. But there was only one God in history who wanted to be a man. For you and for me. That is Jesus Christ. This is the gospel, friends. Remember this parable, Matthew 13, verse 44. The Bible says, And again, the kingdom of heaven is likened to a treasure hidden in the field, the which when a man had found, he hides it, and for joy thereof, goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Remember this parable? The parable of a man who saw a treasure. He was digging in, land, in a portion of the land. He was digging, and he saw this treasure, and he was so surprised. This treasure is worth everything he has. And so as he dug up his treasure, he saw it, kept it. He went back home and said, look, I'm going to sell everything I have. My watch, my phone, my home, everything. I'm going to sell it, and I'm going to buy this land so I could get the treasure. And, Eleanor, and, and, and the Bible said that is the kingdom of heaven. And usually, this is how we apply it. This is how we apply it. We apply it this way. The treasure is the truth. And anyone who stumbles upon the truth needs to give up everything, gives up everything, that we may get the truth. That's how we apply it, right? Oh, now I no longer eat pork. Oh, now I no longer drink Starbucks. <laughs> I'm not picking a Starbucks. That's the only thing I can remember right now. Now I'm no longer doing this. I've given up all that I may attain the truth. Right? But let me introduce another idea to you. According to Ellen White, the book Christ's Object Lesson, she said, that treasure is you. And the man who found the treasure is Jesus. Do you know what Jesus did? He went back home, saw, saw a treasure. Ooh, a treasure. He saw you. Isn't that amazing that we're called a treasure? My mom will probably disagree. 
Because <laughs> growing up, I was never a treasure in her eyes. <laughs> Many children growing up, not a treasure. But in the eyes of God, you're a treasure. Even though you're covered by dirt, even though you have so many scratches, in the eyes of Jesus, you're a treasure. That means God sees beyond your dirt, he sees a treasure. And so he went back home, sold everything he has, died in the cross, that he might buy you. That's the story of the gospel. That's your story. He went from heaven, came down, that he may redeem us. And this is the theme of the Bible. If someone asks you, Jasper, what's the theme of the Bible? Some people say, oh, it's the cross, the theme of the Bible. It's true. It's the sanctuary that is the theme of the Bible. It's true. But if I get to put in one sentence what the theme of the Bible is, the theme of the Bible is very simple. A God relentlessly chasing after man. Uh, many of you can't relate to that if you're younger. So if you're young, let me illustrate to you on your terms. Gen Zs and millennials. God, how do I illustrate this? Have you ever had a very attached ex-girlfriend before? <laughs> it's a bad illustration, but it kind of like nails the board. If you have a very attached ex-girlfriend and you blocked her many times and no social media and she's still on your DMs, please come back. Can we meet in McDonald's? I just need to talk to you one more time. Have you been in that situation before? You block this dude and woman. Like, dude, I'm no longer, I don't want to be with you anymore. And they're always there. No, please come back. That's technically what the theme of the Bible is. Israel was like, no, no other gods, no sin, no fornication. No, I want this. No, I want that. And God is always there. Look, not forcing himself to us, but look, come, come. He's always there. That's the theme of the Bible restoring broken relationship. You can see this throughout the Bible. The language that has always been used in the Bible. God, when God created Adam and Eve, he, he created when, when, when sin was invented, right? He invented the sanctuary. The language of the sanctuary was, hey, make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. We have something called the church communion. What does that mean? Come into union. Come together. The language of the New Testament is bride and the groom. We have a language called the day of atonement in the state of oneness. At one meant. In the state of being one. It's all about building a broken relationship. In fact, what is Jesus called in the book of Isaiah? He's called Emmanuel, God with us. It's always about God chasing after man. I want to be with you. I want to be with you even though you say no. That's the theme of the Bible. And so God dwelt and made a home among us. So this is my dream church, ladies and gentlemen. My dream church is, so the word became flesh and dwelt among us an incarnational church, a church that dwells and is in proximity with people, a church that is willing to come down where people are, not wait for people to come up and they'll welcome them, a church that is willing to go and say, look, come as you are, not where you should be. I'm, we're willing to come and meet you. You don't have to come up here, but we'll go together. That's my dream church. An incarnational church, a church that is willing to invest in people more than programs. That's my dream church. A church that is willing to answer that word, the problem, alone. The answer to that, friends, is fellowship. That's the answer to this problem, the word alone. This is the answer to this. The Bible has given us the answer. It's called fellowship. You see this throughout the New Testament. In Greek, they call it koinonia, fellowship. Check this out. In Greek, it means, koinonia means community, connection, fellowship, participation, doing life together. This is what church is all about. 
It's all about fellowship. And if your church does not have that, it's just a mere program. But programs, that doesn't necessarily mean church. This is what church in the New Testament means. In fact, did you know that the word church in the New Testament is mentioned 114 times and never once it referred to a building? That means this is not the church. You are the church. <laughs> Do you get that? I grew up in a concept where a building is church and church is holy. But let me tell you this, friends. The building is never holy. This, this like there, is never holy. It's only holy because you're here. And so we have put this mindset and we're growing up a generation where holiness is compartmentalized. Holiness is only a geographical place. Oh, look, I can be the devil for the rest of the week as long as I go to the church and be okay and be an angel. Right? I grew up in that concept. Oh, look, Sabbath. I should not do this. But outside, okay. Right? I bawa lang shorts, di ba? Kay holy man. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's never compartmentalized. Church is you. So you don't go to church. You are the church. You don't go. You be. You see the difference? Don't just go. You be. And so wherever you are, you may be in SM. You may be in Ukraine. Wherever you are. Wherever you are put, holiness is no longer a geographical place you go enter into. Church is everywhere. You are the church. Holiness is not a switch you can turn it off because you're outside the door and premises of a building. Church is everywhere. When you talk to your wife alone, when you talk to your kids alone, when you, no one's watching you, you are a church. Church is everywhere. And so we have this concept that church is a compartment, like it's just a place. <laughs> Holiness is just a place. But friends, we should not church God. Remember the conversation between Jesus and the woman at the well? The woman at the well was like, well, look, you worship there in that mountain and you worship God in spirit in, over there, right? When you go there and, and salvation is only for the Jews. <laughs> and Jesus said, look, sister, there'll come a time where you worship God in spirit and in truth. And God is no longer confined in a building. He's everywhere with you. That's what church is all about. Koinonia. Listen to this. This is from, it's from San Pasco. He said, Christianity started in Palestine as a fellowship. It moved to Greece and became a philosophy. It moved to Italy and became an institution. It moved to Europe and became a culture. And it came to America and became an enterprise. It's kind of sad, but it's true. Church started as a fellowship, a family of believers. And if you're not like that, friends, it's not a church. In fact, I'm going to challenge you guys today. You will not like me after this sermon. But that's okay. I'm going to leave after, after this message. Let me, can, can I put back the screen, please? Check this out. I believe that the lack of authentic fellowship brings this interest to young people today. I'm going to give you an idea. The lack of authentic fellowship and definition of the church is one of the reasons why we're losing a lot of young people. And I don't have much experience as a pastor, but I, as I travel in 50 countries, this is one of the reasons why we're losing a lot of our young people today. Ron, this, is, this is one of the, the quote here, Max Dupree. He says this, the first responsibility of a leader is to define reality. And most of the time when I talk to church members, I usually just talk to a general audience but let me talk to the elders and the pastors and the church officers in this church. And if you're listening online, if you're a leader, this is a message for you. Ron Dupree said, Max Dupree said, the first work of a leader is to define reality. Let me ask you a question. What is our reality today? 
The reality is we're losing a lot of our young people. We're losing a lot of our young adults. Would you believe that? Would you agree with that? Am I the only one who's observing this? Isn't that, are we not? Remember, we used to have two services in Pasai, right? And now we only have one. What's happening? And again, you probably will not like me after this, but this is the reality. And so let me present to you an idea. Check these statistics out. This is from David Trim, 2022 Annual Council Statistical Report of our general conference in our world church. Check out what they've studied. Since 1965, there are 42 million people have been member of the SDA church. Of those 42 million, 17 million have chosen to leave the church. And of course, there's a lot of factors to it, right? But listen to this. They said our net loss rate at the church is 42%. The first time I read this, I was so scared. That means 42% of members are leaving the church. Isn't that scary? That's super scary. That means, check this out, four out of 10 Adventists are leaving the church. That's four out of 10. And one of that might be your kids. It might be us. Check this out. 22... David Trim is still speaking. We know from research conducted by ASTR that most did not leave because of theological differences. Notice that. Mark this. Most people did not leave because there's a doctrinal issue at church. Did you, did you hear that? Because we're not preaching the Sabbath enough. <laughs> That's not the issue. <laughs> Notice this. Instead, they went through a crisis in life and they experienced conflict in their local church community. But notice this. They stopped attending church, not intending to be permanent, but they felt unmissed, uncared for, unimportant in the eyes of their pastors and fellow members, and so they did not return. The problem, one of the problems, and of course there's a lot of problems and we can sit down uh, mentioning all these problems, but one of the biggest problems why we're losing a lot of young people is because we don't have fellowship. We don't have authentic fellowship. We're so focused on programs, but not on people. And 42% of them are leaving the church. That's scary. Notice this. There's a Barna study by, in, in Canada by 16,000 people. And they asked them, look, if you get to mention the most important thing that you want a church to do every Sabbath to support you, what would it be? So technically what they're asking is that what, does, what can a church give you every week that is most important for you? Notice what's the most important for young adults, youth and young adults. They said connection and community, 45%. Prayer and emotional support, 45%. Opportunity to serve and help others, 35%. And notice this, a Bible-centered message and hope and encouragement, only 29%. But notice this, Young people are coming to church for emotional support. But all we give them are hymns and sermons. So I give you the statistics, elders and pastors. You listen to this, and we go home and brush this as if nothing has happened. Oh, that's fine. We're all right. Or we take this by heart, do a board meeting. We need to do something different. It was Albert Einstein. I don't know if it's really Einstein who said, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing all over again, expecting a different result. We can't be doing church the same. There needs to be something to be done. Ellen White said, method needs to be improved. We're losing a lot of the young people. And all we do is sing and do sermons. There needs to be something better here, friends. I posted this one time. And... One of our friends that were baptized in my meetings who kind of messed up in his spiritual life commented on the post and she said, the church were the first people I ran away from when things didn't go well, not the people I ran into. That hurt me as a church pastor. I was like, man, oof. I want my young people when they mess up to first think of the church as a place of refuge, not a place to run away from. I would love to have a church like that. That's time's up. I'm almost done.
alone. The answer to this is fellowship. This is SD, the SSD, friends. And this, I'm giving you statistics here. We're losing, for the past 25 years, we've lost 1.1 million people in our division. Our division is number one, one of the top in baptisms. And we're also the number one in loss per ratio. We've lost more people than any divisions in the world. Something different needs to be done. Barna SDA Millennial Study says this, 36% of surveyed Adventist youth in the U.S. reported that they did not feel like they belonged at church. 33% did not feel like they could be themselves at church. 47% indicated that their church was an exclusive club. How many of you believe that sometimes? It does feel like that. And nearly 60% reported that while they used to be involved in church, they did not fit anymore. And Barna's study says around 60 to 70% of our young people, after high school, they leave the church. You know why? They're no longer under our premises. They obey God, go to church, not because they love Jesus and the community, but because they're obligated to do it. Obligation is not a good motivation. Obligation eventually fades. You look at most of my friends, also some of my close family members, they're no longer at church because in the beginning, they're just obligated. They don't have a relationship with church. There needs to be something that needs to be done here. I could give you a good, feel-good sermon so you can just go home and be encouraged this Sabbath. But I need to tell you, there is a problem, and we're losing a lot of our young people. In the U.S., in Germany, Norway, as I travel, did you know that in the ten, five to ten years from now, some of the churches will no longer exist because our churches are growing older, not younger. People are dying at church, and young people are no longer there. There needs to be a change, friends. I wish I could give you more about this, but they'll kick me out. Youth retention, this is from the NAD. Youth retention in NAD is about 20%. Meaning, listen to this, 8 out of 10 young people leave the church. This is NAD, of course, it's different than the Philippines, I understand that. But that is a scary statistic. Out of those 8 people might be your kids. There needs to be a change in our culture. Young adults who have left Adventism since 1965, 10 million young adults since 1965 have left the church. And 60% of that 10 million is actually 39 below. So this is pretty young. Yes, we can talk about people who died of COVID and all that, but this is mostly young people who left our church. Obligation does not hold people. We need this. Koinonia, an authentic relationship. My friend Ty says this, people almost always stay where they feel seen, heard, figured in, and loved. They always stay where they feel seen and loved. I understand that, and I've experienced that, friend. There needs to be an experience beyond programs. You see, information without relationship is always intimidation. And see, Seventh-day Adventists, we are expert in intimidating people. <laughs> without proper building of relationships. <laughs> I'll just tell them the truth. Importante daw, nasabihan na sila ng katotohanan. <laughs> right? That's our theme all the time, but there needs to be a deeper, closer relationship. We need koinonia. And so I'll wrap this up, my dear friends. Ellen White says this. This is from Minister of Healing. She said, Christ, we've memorized this already, and this is very important. Christ's method alone will give True success in reaching the people. And notice Jesus' ministry. She said, The Savior mingled with people as one who desired their good. He showed sympathy for them, ministered to the needs, and won their confidence. And notice the last part. She said, Then he invited them, Come, follow me. Notice that. Jesus said, Come as you are. Come, I'll be with you. This is Jesus' concept. You belong first before you believe. You know why many of us are not doing that at church? Because it's not sexy. It's so slow. It's not like, for two weeks we have 50 baptisms. 
right? We love those reports, but yet we don't talk about the amount of people leaving a church. We just love the evangelism posters. We need to do something better. Jesus said, look, you belong first, then you believe. I commune with you before conversion. Communion blossoms only after conversion. Check this out. Luke chapter 7, 34, 35. Jesus said, I'm going to rush through time here. The Son of Man came eating and drinking. Who's the Son of Man again? Matthew 18, 11. This is Jesus. The Son of Man came to save that which was lost. And by the way, interestingly enough, you want to do exegesis on this. Matthew 18, 11, or the Son of Man, the word Son of Man is mentioned three times in the book of Luke. The Son of Man came to serve that which... Oh, sorry. Let me begin first. The Son of Man um, saved that which was lost. And the second son of man is, the son of man came to serve, not to be served. And the third son of man is, the son of man came eating and drinking. Notice that. Jesus said, look, I'm going to save the lost. I'm going to serve you. How? I'm going to sit down and eat with you. This is why in the book of Luke, Jesus was called patay gutom. Glutton, because the Pharisees would always see Jesus like, dude, this guy is always eating. Why? Why? This is how important potluck is, ladies and gentlemen. Why are you always eating with people? <laughs> because eating in the ancient time means building a community. Look, I'm inviting you in my table. You are part of my family. And so when the Pharisees saw that, dude, Prostitutes and drunkards are part of your family? That's odd. And you call yourself religious? I thought you're religious. Why are you building community with unbelievers? These are drunkards. And you always eat with people. Jesus' mindset was like, look, I'm going to eat with you guys. This is my method in ministry. And yes, he heals people. He taught people. But we never emphasize the amount of times Jesus ate. He always eats with people. This is my favorite Jesus' ministry. Eating. Koinonia. Fellowship. Let me tell you a little experience. Of course, I give you a lot of theory. Let me give you an experience, right? Because you're like, oh, you're always talking about stuff. You're so young. Someone actually told me, you're so young. Why are you teaching us? <laughs> But let me tell you something based on experience. I was, I entered ministry for about, I'm not even going to tell you because I sound so old. But this is how I look like for the past, what, 10 years. I traveled around 50 countries doing evangelism campaign, doing all these things around the world, right? This is how it looks like. Then COVID came. Remember COVID? They closed their churches. And so for the past few years before COVID, my work is bringing people to church, Come to my church, come to my seminar, listen to my programs and seminars. All I do is bringing people to church. Then COVID came, and I'm like, dude, how do we do this? And I can't do church anymore because the church is closed. And so I went to San Bernardino, California, near Loma Linda. I was stuck there. And so this is how it looked, my church looked like. My friends was like, dude, there's so many homeless people in San Bernardino. They don't have any food because soup, uh, the, the soup center, and that's how we call it, um, they're all closed because of COVID. They, they have no food. And so we said, okay, let's go to the streets and let's buy burgers, <coughs> vegetarian, those judgmental people, vegans, <laughs> vegetarian burgers. I always need to emphasize that because we're like, what? You're a pastor, you eat meat? vegetarian burgers. We bought vegetarian burgers. We go and serve the community. We always give them food, sit down with them for hours. We would sit there. And we have this concept. You know what? Instead of bringing people to church, let's bring church to the people. Let's we'll bring people church where people are. Sit down with them, knowing their names. One of the homeless people, a person said, this is Shaggy, by the way, my good friend. And he, one of them told us, look, Jasper, we like you guys. Because you sat down with us, and you know our names. Some of the churches, they will come to us and just give us food, take pictures of us, and they leave. And I've realized that's how church is. We consider people as projects. People are not projects. They're human beings. And you know what's impo more important than people knowing the church's name? 
is when the church knows people's names. That's the most important. It doesn't matter if the people know the Seventh-day Adventist Church. What's the most important part of this church is the Seventh-day Adventist Church knowing people's names outside. And so we sat down with them. Look, what's your problem? We give them people from Loma Linda. We post it on Facebook. Who knows how to make a resume? Can you teach someone how to make a resume? Can you teach someone and give them a suit when they apply on a job? Give them a hotel room. You see, even the dog said amen. Do this, do that, right? Help these people. Sat down with them for weeks. They're not projects. Come. Sit down with them. Let's eat with them. And notice this. We bring the church with them. We know their names every single day for seven months. It's not, by the way, it's not, it doesn't look good in reports. Because seven months, dude, you haven't had baptisms. It doesn't look good. But we serve them. We just ate with them. We don't care about statistics. We just want to sit down with people. You belong here first before you believe. Your family first. Guess what? After seven months. 29, 35 people baptized. They almost have baptisms every week. Because they say, look, I feel safe. I feel like I belong. I want to be part of that. Whatever is that that you have, <laughs> I want that. Because conversion always blossoms out of communion. You don't believe me? Jesus was walking, and Zacchaeus was there on top of the tree, and Jesus was like, dude, what are you doing there? He's like, hey, Jesus, I want, just want to see you. And remember Jesus said? Jesus said, look, Zacchaeus, come down. I will dine at your house. Let's eat together. And they come, and they ate together, right? And then Jesus said, ooh, salvation has come to this house. After dinner. I told you, man. <laughs> we got to eat more. Salvation blossoms after that. This is my home. This is my home. This, the young kids around my community. When COVID came, the kids, they had nothing to do. So my sister said, look, let's open our house. Let's answer their modules. Let's play with them together every day. Let's open. And uh, let me show you some more pictures here. We would swim together. Every day we would jog together. We would do workouts. And we would eat together every day. Just open the house. This is how my, my home looks like every night during COVID. Look, that's my mom smiling. Did you see her on the right? She's smiling. But deep inside, she's like, Wala na tayong bigas. Ano ka? <laughs> she was so mad at me. Jasper, who's gonna buy rice next month? <laughs> Wala na tayong bigas. Pina because we're feeding 15 people. But I was like, Ma, just be patient. I'll buy rice. Just cook for, for them every night. So we would eat with them every night. Now again, this is not an evangelistic campaign and it's kind of slow because you need to build friendship. But again, just sit down, eat with people, listen to them, make them feel like they're figured in this community. So they're sit down and do worship with us at night. I've never, I've never showed doctrines to them. No, no, no. They're just part of the family. Whenever they have problems with their teeth, I emailed, my, I messaged my friend from AUP. He said, can you guys come and fix their teeth? I'll pay your ticket. So I flew them and they did root canals and postizo and everything. They did everything. All right? Because they're family. They don't have to be baptized. They're just family. Do outreach together. You belong first before you believe concept. So my grandma's home, my grandma said, I'll do the same. Every night, my grandma's home is like this, until now. They go, look. They go sit down together, listen to the word, eat together. Because salvation is not only in church pews, it's also in circles. This is where salvation is beginning. And do you know what happened? All of them got baptized. We have a 70% increase of our church membership that we have to divide the church because it's now too big and we won't fit. By one recipe, just eat with people. You guys think I'm exaggerating this, huh? Baptism has come because we've invested in people more than church programs. You've got to go out of this church program situation, friends. This is, I'm running out of time. Okay, I'm, I'm rushing. This is in, in, in we have a helicopter in, in, in Palawan. We have, uh, we, we rescue people. 
Uh, this is pilot Daniel, he's a volunteer pilot, the Philippine Adventist Medical Aviation Services, and we do medical evacs around, around the jungles of Palawan. The hospitals are so far. You know, it, you, if you're in the jungles, it could take you eight hours to go to the nearest hospital. And some people would die, and so they would do rescues around the communities. This is one of the communities we visited. And one of the problems I saw in the community, and this is where it's important to live with people. Because sometimes we are in the community, for the community, but we're never with the community. That means we do our little board meetings and say, oh, what do they need? Ah, they need a book. Let's go out and give people books. And so we hear, you need a book. No, no, no. Is that what they really need? We need to ask ourselves, and we need to ask ourselves, what do they really need in that situation? And so we were giving them food, pagkain, uh, lahat, clothes. But I realized this the kids are growing up without education, no education at all. Kids are getting married at the age of 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Can you imagine that? Seeing kids getting married at the age of 13, 14 years old, dalawa na yung baby, it's so sad. And I was like, man, I could give food, but there needs to be something more than food. They need education. We need to build them a school. And so I posted in my Instagram, <coughs> follow me on in Instagram. <coughs> We put this on Instagram and I said, look, let's post this on Instagram. And by the way, I was called to be a pastor somewhere in San Diego. I was about to say yes. And I told Pilot Daniel, Pilot Daniel, I only have four days to be in the jungles of Palawan. I'll stay there and film you for four days only, huh? And then we realized, dude, these people need schools. And so I had to wrestle with my heart. Like, Lord, where do you want me to go? Do I, do I need? Because I was so pressured. Kailangan mo na mag-asawa. Kung gusto mo asawa, dapat may trabaho ka na. That was the whole conversation. I was like, man, I need, a, I need work so I can get a wife. That was the whole theme of last year. But I was like, what do I do? There's so many kids that need help. And by the way, this is a segue. But young people, if you're struggling where your calling is, a friend of mine gave me a really wonderful tip. He said, Jasper, you want to know your calling in your life? Ask yourself, what breaks your heart? Because usually, what breaks your heart is what God has called you to do. And so I have to ask myself that question. Jasper, what breaks your heart? Is it only finding a sec secure job? No, no, no. What breaks my heart is seeing kids getting married at the age of 14. They need to have education. And so that four days came seven months. <laughs> I stayed in the jungles, grew my hair. People said, you backslidden because your hair is long. No, I, I'm still in the faith. But I stayed there in the jungles of, the, of Palawan, helping out building a school. I posted this, my dear friends, on my social media. We've raised 5 million people out of Inst uh, in Instagram in just one year. 5 million pesos in Instagram. We built a school. This is a little school in a remote place. And that's the skeleton of the first school. We have 120 kids enrolled. We stayed there. We knew their names. We just ate with them every single night. We build a small community. And this is a humble, church, a humble school. And by the way, we're in our second school right now. Second school in the jungles of Palawan. But there's one particular story there. Enrollment time. And the parents came to enroll their kids. This is them enrolling, writing their names. And those are the fathers writing their names. The kids' names. And one time they were writing, there's a section there that they did not understand. Some of these guys don't know how to read and write. And so they asked me, Kuya Jasper, what is this? Ano ang yong religion? What is your religion? That was the section there. What is your religion? They didn't understand. And they said, Brother Jasper, ano nga tayo? What are we again? I said, oh, kami, Adventist kami. Kayo, depende sa inyo kung ano kayo. Hindi ba? Ano ba ta ano tayo? Say, kayo, depende na sa'yo. Pero ako, Adventist po ako. Sabi nila, ah, yun din kami. <laughs> so then, the katutubo, the indigenous people, they wrote in their enrolled form, Seventh-day Adventists. Because they feel they're part of the family. This is what church is supposed to be like. And that is what my dream church looks like. Last story, now close. This is me in Ukraine a few months ago when the war broke. 
and was traveling, we have an initiative of rescuing kids because fathers are not allowed to go out of Ukraine. If you're 18 to 60 or 70, you're not allowed to go out of Ukraine. And so mothers will go out of Ukraine and some of them are human trafficked, become slaves and, and all these things that are happening to them. And so we decided the damage was so bad. Look at that. These are my pictures when I was there. A town called Bordoyanka destroyed. This is a, we have a bus, Child Impact International, sponsored a bus from Germany, filled it with food, super big bus, bring it to Ukraine. We traveled for 30 hours to bring it to Ukraine. Drop the food and supply, fill it with people. See, this is a picture of the father saying goodbye to their wives because they can't go out. This is some of the kids that I encountered with. Is the bus filled with mothers and children. It was a very sad sight knowing that some of these parents, they don't even know if they're going to see their husbands again. And what we did was we filled it with people, drove all the way to Austria and Germany, and they're going to be meet with Andreas's company. Andreas is one of the CEO of Optimo in Austria, an ASI. Optimo is famous for their mattresses. Their mattresses are worth like 50,000 pesos, really expensive mattresses, right? And they said, look, let's welcome refugees. And this is their, this is their um, show center. They said, look, let's convert the show center into a refugee center. And so instead of doing, showing products there, they put refugees to sleep there. And Andreas, the CEO, not only housed refugees in the center, but adopted a Ukrainian family. That means that Ukrainian family is going to live with them every single day until the war ends. In Germany, they're going to be, have a free healthcare, going to be, they're going to have free schooling, they're going to have all a lot of freebies, right? I will be taken care of. And so this is the funny part. If you go out, if you go out of the border from Romania in the town called Socheva, the families that we brought to Germany text their family in Ukraine and said, look, when you go out of the border, find the Adventist bus. They always take care of people. <laughs> Not only that they're, because if you go to the border, Israelis, Turkish, Red Cross, everyone is there. But they don't have the same care as a dentist. Oh, look, we would house you. You will not be in a dormitory or in a center. You will be in our homes. We'll feed you. We'll bring you to school. We'll have, you have free transport. We'll take care of you. And so when you go out, find the Adventist bus. So even non-SDA Ukrainians, they would say, we're Adventists. <laughs> oh, what's your, we're Adventists too, you know? <laughs> because they're taken care of. And ladies and gentlemen, if you ask me what my church will look like, this is what my church will look like. I want my church to be known, not because we don't eat pork and go to church on Sabbath and not watch movies and go to Starbucks. I want my church to be known as a loving church, a church that is willing to go in an extra mile and do more people-centered activities than just mere programs at church, that is willing to go out there and say, look, let's create programs to bring our young people and build an authentic community. Go biking, go diving somewhere. I don't know. Build a community in your homes. And I promise you, friends, this church will grow. And that is my dream church. And so I ended with a quote from an old lady in the 1800s. She said in the book, Testimonies, Volume 9, she said, if we would humble ourselves before God and be what everyone? Kind and courteous and tenderhearted and pitiful, there will be 100 conversions to the truth where now there's only one. She said, if you want your church to grow to hundreds and even thousands, start being pitiful. Stop being, start being loving. Notice she never said, memorize the Ten Commandments. Do this and do that. No, no, these are important. But most importantly, is that you're kind, you're pitiful, you're tenderhearted, you're loving. And she said, you'll have 100 conversions to the truth. And now there's only one. Uh, people outside in that community, outside of these premises, will look at this church and not only say, look, people who go to church on Sabbath, Sabbathistas. No, 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 no. 
they'll look at it and say, that's a place of refuge. I feel safe when I'm there. I feel I belong when I'm there. That's my church. Do you want your church to be like that? It goes start with your homes, friends. Start with your social media. Whatever it is, start somewhere. And I promise you, this will grow. Let's pray. Father in heaven, so many things to say yet, so little time. But I pray, Father, that you bless the message. I pray, Father, that our church will step out, Lord, of doing mere programs every Sabbath. But may the church be a lifestyle. I pray, Father, that every day we bring the church, not only in a certain day, Father, I pray, Father, that you give us an authentic, loving community that people will see Jesus in us and our life, Lord, would testify that we have been with Jesus today. Guide us, Father, that people will see Jesus in us, that we will draw more people to you today. Guide us, Father, and may the message will not just be a mere theoretical understanding of the truth, but it may be an experience for each and every one of us. In Christ's name, amen. Happy Sabbath, everyone. God bless. Praise God for that inspiring message. And for our response, let us stand and sing hymn number 348, The Church Has One Foundation.
Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for this beautiful Sabbath day. Thank you for the message that you have given. I pray, Father, as we go out of this church building, that we will bring the church to where people are. Thank you for making our hearts in this world our home. Are you willing to give up your life for us? Help us to, willing, to be willing to relocate ourselves to where people are to, just like Jesus. In Christ's name, amen.